Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happened Now is brought to you by Fujisports.com. Listen, for your geese, your mats, your shin guards, your mouthpieces, your fucking Muay Thai gloves, there's only one stop, and that's fucking Fujisports.com. All my geese are Fuji. That's all. I, I fucking live in Fuji. I'm a fat fuck. What happens is I get in your guard, you tug, you tug, you tug on my neck like I'm about to commit suicide, like I'm Anthony Bourdain, but you never going to get me. Because I got a Fuji gi. It's tougher. You can hang on my fucking gi like a fucking gorilla and you won't rip that motherfucker. That's why I only run with Fuji Sports. So do yourself a favor. You're looking for a gi, a fat man gi, A5, A6. Fuji Sports is your answer. For, go to Fujisports.com right now and press in. Church. Bam! And get 10% off delivered right to your motherfucking crib. That's how we do it. Help out the podcast. Number two, Onnit's got a new thing. It's called Onnit 6. It's a six weeks transformational, transformational exercise program. You go on Onnit. You log in. I think it's forty nine dollars for six weeks. You work out with Aubrey, I think, or one of his buddies for an hour every day in the privacy of your own home. Fucking phenomenal. Give it a shot. Like I'm saying, if it's either that or the supplements, on it's always there for you. Whether it's Alpha Brain or the Shroom Tech or the fucking uh, protein powders, whatever you need, they got you covered. Go to onit.com right now and press in. Church. Bam. And get ten percent off delivered to your motherfucking crib. But let me tell you something. The future is here. I've been telling you cocksuckers for years that the future's here. They got here. You people that want roller skates that fly in the air, that's great. <laughs> you know what I got? I got Breeze. I got Breeze 1,000 milligram breath mints. Listen to this. Listen, listen. That's a breath spray right there, cocksuckers. 10 fucking shots of fucking spray. That's the future. You understand me? When you go to your little weed store, tell them, Uncle Joey says, I want the Breeze spray. Where the fuck is the Breeze spray and the Breeze mints? That's what you need. Kick this fucking mule, Lee. It's Monday morning. That's fucking Sammy Hagar. Hey, there's a... This is Sammy Hagar with Ronnie Montrose, like 19 fucking 70 something. Hey, Lee, can you play uh, Making Love by Kiss? Just 15 seconds. Go ahead. It 15 seconds. Like it sounds just like this. Watch. Making Love, Kiss. I don't know which one came out first, but it's basically... There you go. There's... Oh, Jesus Christ. There you go. That's Asuka. making love right there. <laughs> We're opening up fucking Father's Day strong. This is tremendous. And double platinum. Yeah, I don't know what year that came out. That year, uh, Ronnie Montrose, who the fuck knows? What's space, going on here, bro? Space, space Station, what year did that space come out? Space Station number five. Because Making nine. Love came out in 76, 77. Yeah, so maybe Montrose lifted it. Maybe Montrose got <laughs> it's, sticky it's a, fingers. It's a very basic riff. There's a there's actually five million songs like that. Like this, yeah, no. There's another song that sounds like this, too, uh, by Michael, uh, 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 by you know, Michael Shankner. Yeah. There's another song by Rush that sounds a little like this. It's weird. If you uh, Blackout by by Scorpions, uh, it's similar to that, too. <clears throat> yeah, the beginning of Blackout. You're uh, right. Uh, 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 uh. Blackout was oh. such a fucking huge album, if people remember. That song crushed me. Which that one, song, Blackout? Yeah, I, really? didn't, I actually didn't want to like Scorpions because when you're a kid, um, you kind of attach yourself to a band, like a like a football team. Like the, the album that you bought, like if I bought a, I bought a Kiss record, none of my other friends are going to buy Kiss records. They're just going to borrow mine and tape it, right? And then if my, my buddy buys Rush, I'm not going to buy Rush. No, that's his band. I'm gonna tape that shit, right? But whoever owns the master, like the album, that's like their band. You know what I mean? So I didn't want to like Scorpions because Eric bought Scorpions. Uh, I had he bought the Scorpions first, so I was gonna fuck with Scorpions, just borrow shit. When I borrow Blackout and I put fucking the song Blackout on, fuck that that song destroyed me. I played on my stepdad's Fisher uh, stereo when he was in at work. I wasn't allowed to play my records on uh, his stereo, but when he was at work, I because he had um two speakers i had one speaker in my room i didn't even know what stereo was so i thought i would listen to kiss records but only hear one guitar i, I didn't understand stereo i didn't know there was more music coming out of the other speaker so when i'd play my kiss records on my dad's stereo my stepdad's stereo when he was at work i was like what the fuck there's new parts in this shit i heard like other guitar parts I'm like, what the fuck is going on he's got like a magical stereo didn't get it i was like seven <laughs> anyways <It's> tremendous <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous! I love all this shit. But Blackout fucked me up. Blackout is the song, man. I was like, "Fuck! I don't really want to like them, that Scorpions, that much." But shit, you can't deny. They got Blackout. a couple good songs on that album. That's the same. Yeah. On the other side, they got one of my favorite songs they've ever done. That was in the Wrestler. 
strippers dance to it a lot. It's What's a the name of the song? Yeah. I don't fucking know. It don't matter. <laughs> it's just one of those jams. Scorpions are a weird band because I got into them. I got into like one of my favorite Scorpion albums is Animal Magnetism. Mm -hmm. When the chick's about to blow the dog or something like that. She's what? kneeling down next to a fucking Doberman Pinscher or oh. something like that. They had a couple good songs. They had Scorpions a lot of good songs, but I was trying to resist them. I mean, I. I I didn't like uh, the guy's vocals. I didn't like the Me fact neither. That, I'm not crazy about this. I didn't like the fact that you can hear his accent in the music. You know what I mean? I for some reason as a kid, it was hard for me to accept. Like you can tell, like, you know, live he would go, Oh boy, California You know, he sounded like he was Asian, you know, it was it was No, nah, the Hitler concept was Yeah, and he was tell. four foot eight and yeah, he had, yeah. he had he didn't have good hair. I just judged too much on appearance. You but had the guitar players were fucking phenomenal. Yeah. All of them. Ru Claus, Rudolf Schenker. Rudolf Schenker, Michael, and uh there's a funny video of um, fucking Michael just torturing Rudolf. That he covered the band, he carried the band, he's a fucking bum. Tremendous shit. <laughs> Thank you for coming to Disneyland the other day. Oh, that dude, was, are you uh, kidding? That was awesome. That man. was surreal because I wanted to, we were going to go to Legoland first. And uh, my wife called me back. She goes, bro, it's two hours. She's going to puke 18 times. Yeah. Why don't we just pull the fucking trigger and go to Disneyland? And I was like, let's do it. So look up, you know, whatever. And she came back and she goes, I don't even want to tell you. But let's go. And uh, my wife called your wife and I'm happy that the. Uh, the kids had a great time. Well, the thing that was special about this is uh, we didn't have to wait in any goddamn lines, man. No. You got that. You got that Jennifer Lopez we ticket. Went like you know, pimps, bro. <laughs> I can't go back to Disneyland any other way now. No. I can't do it. I got used no. to it. I got spoiled. No, that's... Being able, having a guide mm, walk no. you to any ride you want, because that fast pass shit, that shit don't work. Shit you don't buy work. fast pass and you, you check the app and like nothing's available. That's some bullshit. That's a ripoff. And well, I don't want to say a ripoff. I don't want to say bullshit. I'm just, it's not what I expected. I take that back. I don't want to get sued. Well, I take do you that know back. What the fuck happened the other day? You didn't I haven't talked okay, to you really so about it. We get up, you know, whatever. We all meet at nine. We're going to get the, the tour guide to whatever. I think we got high, right? Did we get high upstairs? We <laughs> no, I didn't. I no, smoked. I didn't. No. <laughs> and I had an edible in my pocket. I had a fucking tushy, a, t a TKO edible in my pocket. And I'm like, it's Disneyland. What, what, you know, what's the big fucking deal? So as I walk in, they got metal detectors. And me being the asshole that I am, I took that tushy out of my pocket. Oh, no. Nine out of ten, I leave that shit in my pocket. Yeah. It's not going to ring. And if it does ring, oh, well. Then you go, oh, it's this breath mint or whatever. And they look at it and they let you go. Yeah. I took it out of my pocket and this chick's like, oh, you can't go in with that. You have to bring that back to your room. Like, okay, no problem. I go, honey, and you're right there, and Drake was right there, and my wife and my daughter are right there, and I go, let me go back to the room and put this. Now, my idea wasn't, I wasn't going to go back to the room. I was going to go to the hallway in the hotel, eat a piece, and come back. And that's exactly what I did. I went to the hallway, and I ate a piece, and I threw the other piece away. I ate 100 milligrams. That's all I needed. I didn't want fucking a ton of anxiety in this park. I just wanted something to get me in the park and to get me wiggling. You know what I'm saying? Like, just to get me wiggling. I fucking eat it. I walk back up. I go up to the girl, and she goes, well, we had somebody follow you. You didn't go. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was the creepiest thing ever. That You want to piss me off? You want to piss me off? Pull some police shit on me or fucking uh, question me or fucking tell me what to do. Like, that shit drives me crazy. <laughs> All that shit drives me crazy. And when you pull that police, that amateur police shit on me, that really <laughs> pisses me the fuck off. <laughs> You you really want to piss me off? Pull that, that amateur shit on me, like. So she starts <laughs> telling me that I didn't throw it away, and uh, and I'm like, listen, I threw it away, and I go, listen, let's cut this shit. If you don't want me in here, since you threw him up, because I got pissed, I go, since you put fucking the inspector on me, let's go. Inspector. We spent a lot of money for this. We don't need this shit. I'll cancel it right now. And she's like, well, I didn't say that. I go, no, no, that's what you're saying. I go, number two. I go, you know what? Between you and I. You don't get paid enough. You don't get paid enough to give a fuck about this shit. This is an easy job that you're just creating heat for yourself. And I would never say that to somebody, but I'm sick and fucking tired. I'm 55. I hate that fucking amateur cop shit. I always have. You're an amateur cop. 
They're giving you eight bucks an hour to be a security guard. That's what you are. Take it for granted. You're not going to stop no criminals. You're getting eight bucks an hour. Why are you getting so hee hove about this fucking job? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you ever watch the town when they're going to rob that bank? And Ben Affleck keeps telling him, I don't like that guy. He, he buckles his boots up too high. He's a fucking security guard. He's getting six <laughs> bucks an hour, but he thinks he's fucking Rambo. There's those guys out there. I know people who do that job will tell you, rob me. I don't give a fuck. I'm not pulling out my gun for 18 bucks an hour, dog. I'm not pulling it out. I know motherfuckers that have come to me over the years and go, dog, I'm guarding a million bucks on a Tuesday night for fucking 16 an hour. Come hit me in the head with a stick and take that money with 10 gorillas. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really fucking believe that they give a fuck about you and they really they don't give a fuck about you i mean that night i went home and on tv there was a thing about disney they're not even getting 15 bucks an hour so this chick is busting my fucking balls about an edible it's not her park who gives a freedom you know saying like what is wrong with fucking people and you want me to tell you what really pissed me off that i'd love to call her a white fuck but she was mexican that's what really pissed me off she was Mexican trying to act like fucking Mildred. Knock it off. You're not fucking, what's those cops on TV when we were kids on CBS? The two wives. Chips? No, that's the two Mexicans <laughs> with the fucking guy on the motorcycle. That shit pisses me off. Oh but my God. Uh, regardless of that, the security guard came out. They go, we're going to call our boss. The boss came out and the boss asked what happened. I got a fucked up knee and I brought that with me. She told me, I don't need somebody following me back. The lady goes, her name is Martha something, and the guy's name is whatever. Do you want to press formal charges? And I go, no, I just want to fucking be left alone. And she put out her hand. You saw me, and I shook her hand, and I left. Wow. That was how fast that went. We didn't do nothing. But let me tell you something. I'm not going to argue with that little chubby Mexican chick. <laughs> because let me tell you something. Those fucking edibles are not good on a ride. Oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> I got a lot of videotape. Oh, uh, I know you do. I'll be with my eyes closed on all of them. <laughs> People were telling me, you, sh you should make that a show. Go to all these amusement amusement parks like uh, Kurt, uh, Bert Kreischer used to do and just videotape Joey on uh, roller coasters. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good idea. But for this show, you'd have to make him wait in the Let line a little something. bit. It's yeah. fine. Just it's to get fine. him fired up. When you, smoke, <laughs> when you smoke weed and get on a roller coaster, it's one thing. When you do that, when you get on a roller coaster, you start thinking about all the fucking roller coaster accents. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you hit and you go up, you're like, I'm flying <laughs> off this fucking building. That's what I'm scared about. Like when we went down storm, when we went down the last one, what was it? The heavy duty one at the end when you it's all black and shit. Oh, uh, Space Mountain. Space Mountain. We yeah. went down Space Mountain. I was worried about my daughter. If she falls out of that thing, you'll never yeah. see her again. Yeah. It's the buck that's why it's black. You know how many people have fallen out of there and they kids? <laughs> how many people have gotten to the bottom? Where's my kid? Boom, and all of a sudden they get them and they hold them. And they whisk you away in a car and your kid's never seen again. That's yeah. where they fucking take your kids in Disneyland. Yeah. That's where you got to watch your fucking kids. That's who steals your kids. And that's a perfect place to be a fucking pedophile. In Disneyland, a white van pulls up. You mean, did, Disney World just got busted. For what? They arrested some employees that um, were up to no good. You didn't hear about that? It was no. all, all over the internet. I don't know the details, though. No, but, I mean, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. See, that's why when I go to those places, you got to definitely watch the kid. But the whole thing I got out of this Thursday uh, that was funny was, Daddy, we're fucking dads. I yeah. knew you when you were a single guy, and you knew me when I was a single guy. Yeah. And now we're like these fucking dads. Did you ever think this day was going to happen? Never. Never. Did you think you were going to enjoy it as much as you do? I didn't. I was actually scared that I'd be like my father. I thought, what if it's hereditary? What if... I have a kid, and I don't give a fuck. I was really worried about that. And then um, I got a bunny. I, I fucking fell in love with this bunny, man. And I treated it like it was my son. It was crazy. And when it died, it fucking crushed me, man. It crushed me. Do you remember Good Time? Do you ever watch Good Times? The TV show. The Good Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like After like three or four seasons, they had to kill the father off. Uh, John Amos killed him off. And... It was the season finale when Florida was on the phone and, and she gets the call that he's dead. And this is how the season ends. She goes, damn, damn. That's exactly how, what I did when my wife called me to tell me the bunny died. I was on the phone. I was like, damn, screaming. <laughs> I was screaming, man. 
And at that point, I thought, you know what? I, I need to have kids. I'm 40. It's time to do this. You know what I mean? I'm, it's getting too late. I partied enough. I went out. I was single for, you know, 10 years straight. I got that out. I, mean, I don't miss that at all. You know what I mean? If you have a kid in your early 20s, it's going to be in your head that, fuck, maybe I did this too soon and shit. I could be out partying, losing my life and all that shit. When you have a kid, when you're 42, that shit's gone. Like, I'm, I don't miss that shit at all. I've done it all. I don't need it. I know, what, it, I know what it's like. You don't miss UFCs or going to I, nothing. I, if I never, nothing, went, nothing. I never went to a UFC ever it's crazy, again, nothing. I wouldn't give a shit. I've been it's to so too many. It's so crazy. It's so crazy. I've been to too many. Some guy came up to me at the airport. Hey, when is your next UFC? I go, bro, I haven't gone to UFC. I'd rather watch that shit I in my bed on my phone. Go. I can't go. You know I'm scared I mean? half the time to even go anymore. <laughs> Like, I don't go. This was the time I go and now ISIS shows up and shit. Shoot oh motherfuckers in the UFC. I don't need that shit, dog. <laughs> Fuck that. I made my mind up a long time ago. Yeah, UFC, but... UFC gets, UFC, uh, it gets nutty. When I mean, like, Joe, I mean, he's he's like John Lennon and shit. He's got to hide from every other If he stops to take one picture, there's he's going to be swarmed. It's gonna, he's going to be caught up for an hour, you know, taking pictures, you know, because Joe doesn't like to turn down pictures. And, you know, it's... um. It's it's crazy. You, you got to hide there. It is. It's a fucking nutcase, man. I don't know how he does it. I've been to every single UFC between 2003 and 2010. That was my my stint. I, I've been. I, I I've had enough. <laughs> it's the greatest show ever invented. I still watch them. But I don't give a shit about going to see it live anymore. Unless I'm cornering like Tony or something, then then it's fun. But I'd rather watch it on my phone. We're not doing the seventh, by the way. I'm doing the Ice House. Okay. <clears throat> We're not doing the seventh. It was just funny watching you. And it was funny. Like for a while, I was high and I was sitting next to you on rides going, Jesus Christ, who would have saw this coming? <laughs> like I, I love being a dad. Eddie, I could have been a dad at 20. I thought it would have calmed me down. I thought it would have given me a purpose. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I ended up having that kid when I was fucking 27. And now I don't talk to that child at all. So I felt really guilty when I knocked up Terry because a guy like you, I go, what if this doesn't work out? Yeah. I'm going to have two kids out there in the real world and I'm not a bad dad. I know. I know that this is not. This is not what I wanted with Jackie, but this is the way the cards played. There's nothing you could do about it. This is the way the hand played out. I gave up a life to get a life. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm at peace with it now because I left there, but I got something. I became a comedian. I became a human being. I pay my taxes. I go to bed early. I don't do drugs anymore. I became a human being. So I made something in my life. I didn't do it to end up in jail like they thought I would. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now I have that regret, but at the same time, I'm doing the best I could with Mercy. Yeah. You know, and it shows, it reflects, the house is happy. I didn't grow up in a happy house, neither did you. Mm -mm. I don't like, I, I, could, I could see an unhappy house from a mile away. You know what I'm saying? My house is very happy now, but I had to work hard to make that house get happy. Mm -hmm. Like you have to work hard at it. Yeah. You have to have a degree of, of so much input like all this stuff you know when i'm in i love going on the road and i love doing comedy but guess what i love my family more absolutely absolutely and i understand the need to make a living and that's what i basically do i make a living i don't try to kill myself and drive a mercedes benz and get a fucking rocket i get a two million dollar house i don't need that that's just too much that would be stress on me it's like i was telling you guys earlier i finally realized what happened with the Netflix thing in Vegas? I started carrying it. I've always never fucking given a fuck. All of a sudden now I give a fuck about the audience. You can't give a fuck. You have to do what you do and let the audience jump on your channel. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can't change what you do because the audience. So I went into it thinking a little differently. And now from now on, Saturday, I thought about it. I went on stage in Sacramento. If you came to the Calusa Casino, thank you very much. We had a great time. I want to thank my man Sergio for coming out. A bunch of people came out from the podcast, but it was one of my best sets the last two months because I didn't give a fuck. I have two hours of material. Do you know I couldn't do 25 for Netflix two weeks ago? Mm. 25. I could. It was like fucking pulling teeth. 
Hmm. Pulling teeth. I couldn't do fucking. I got two hours of material. Yeah. The how crazy is that way? Pulling teeth. Couldn't come up with 25. One set I did, it was 26 minutes. Yeah, 27 one, years yeah. of doing comedy. I couldn't come up with 20, 30 minutes of material. Someone asked me recently in an interview if I could change anything in my life, what would I do? And I wouldn't change a fucking thing because if anything would, would have been altered, I may have not had my son. And I can't even imagine that. So I don't have any regrets. I did a lot of fucked up shit growing up and made a lot of poor decisions, but they all led to my son. And I wouldn't change anything. Listen, in this life, all we have to do is a couple things right. If you really think about it, you have like five big decisions to make. Everything else, they could be fucking slippery decisions. But those five main ones you got to be on point for. That's it. That's it. It's five decisions. Getting into comedy, not snorting coke anymore. Yeah. Look at us. After all the crazy shit yeah. and how we're brought up and all the crazy shit, yeah. we're at Disneyland with our wives and our children acting like some white people. And two white wives. <laughs> and two white wives to boot. Exactly. <laughs> two white wives to boot. Like, uh, you got white children. It's... Uh, it's fucking surreal what I'm living right now, what I'm saying. Like, you know, one minute you're at home, you got a family, and the next minute you see, like, fucking Kim Kardashian at the White House. <laughs> like, it's so fucking surreal, like, everything around us anymore. You yeah. know, you have to take... But I take what's at the house. I take what I could control, what I try to control, and that's it. I'm good with that shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm really good with that. Everything else is going to happen. You can't control that shit. You don't know that at 29 and 30. You yeah. finally realize that at 45, yeah. 46. Yeah. Can't control everything. You control a couple of things. You control when you pee, when oh, you boy. shit. Yeah. You know, when you go to the bank, you control a couple of things if you get it like this. You don't, that's the only thing you can control. Can't control anything else. It's so yeah. fucking crazy. I'm not the smartest person alive right now, but man, at 30, thinking about, thinking about where I was at mentally, I was dumb as shit. Uh, I didn't know fucking anything. I was so off on so much, so much, man. I was um, I was brainwashed by MTV, man. And I, now looking, I'm just realizing this over the last couple of years, like, holy shit. I was completely programmed by MTV and, and music. You know, I, I was chasing the mansion with all the girls and the Ferraris and all that shit my whole life. I was chasing that. I thought, okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to do it. You got to have uh, motiv motivation, enthusiasm. You got to keep going. You got to have good work ethic. You got to keep working. You got to move to Hollywood, make the music, be around all the record labels, going to get signed, going to blow up, going to sell out arenas. It's going to, you know, that was, I 100% believe that was going to happen, you know, my, most of my life. And now you're looking back, I'm like, fuck. And you, you know me, I'm, I'm a crazy motherfucker. I believe everything's a conspiracy theory. I believe everything is a conspiracy. <laughs> and uh, so I'm crazy. So, um, you know, what I think now is like, pfft. I used to think that, you know, with the PMRC, remember the PMRC, they're, they're like a group of old white ladies that are trying to suppress music and try to put the, um, warning labels on albums. I used to think as a kid that uh, the white people, the elite at the very top, wanted to keep us from doing bad things, wanted to keep us from... Uh, exploiting our, our vices. I, I really thought they were, and you know, I'm a kid. I'm like, fuck, I'll listen to any music I want. I'll listen to Slayer and Metallica. They're trying to tell me not to listen to it. You know, this is bullshit. Don't worry about what, you know, what we listen to. Why are you so concerned with it? I really thought that that was the plan. They were trying to keep us good and trying to keep the family tight. But now, as crazy as I am, I totally, I think it's the opposite. I think they're pretending they were trying to keep a tight family unit. I think now they're doing everything they can. All these operations going on to break, to divide us, break up the family in any way possible, and and uh, as many ways as possible. I think at the very, at the highest level, when they're when you look at privatized prisons, you look at hip hop, and then you look at privatized prisons, even like metal. Look what they're doing to the kids. They're making the kids really uh, look up to people promoting violence. And remember, I'm a kid. I'm growing up. I'm, I, 
I hated the PMRC. I hated the the labels, but it was to me it was a trick. They're pretending they care. Just like think about this. They were pretending they were fighting the war on drugs, right? They were pretending they were bringing the drugs in. They were bringing the drugs in, and they're all like, dare to keep kids off drugs. A war on drugs. All this money came in, tax money to fight the war on drugs. They're bringing it in. They're bringing it in, and there's a now there's war on terrorism. There's all there's a there's a fucking war on terrorism. They're funding it and creating it. Fuck. Same thing with music. It looks like they're trying to fight it and hide it, you know, or 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 uh, keep it at bay. Mm-mm. They like that shit. They want fucked up families. They're trying to split up the families. They want that shit. They want they want us corruptible. Like they want to be able to corrupt us. Everyone that you know, they can corrupt anybody. They can blackmail anybody. They like that shit. That's how crazy I am. That they want us to listen to this bullshit ass music. They want that shit. They never try to stop Slayer. Slayer was, I was a huge Slayer fan. They weren't trying to stop Slayer ever. And I, I wondered, they were trying to stop Accuse. On 2020, they had a um, a show trying to stop uh, Satanism in uh, music. And they had like Twisted Sister and like Judas Priest and all these bands. And I'm 15 thinking, you guys got your way off. How come you're not going after King Diamond? How come you're not going after Creator and Destruction and Slayer? Those guys are literally talking about Satan, killing babies and dragging their souls to hell. That's what their albums are about. Every They're not trying to hide that shit. How come you're not going after them? They never, nobody ever touched them. They were going after like the straw men, like Twisted Sister. Come on, those guys have nothing to do with Satan. But anyway, so at 15, that's when I started to distrust. Like that was ABC 2020 and they got it all wrong. Who's doing the research? I'm 15 going, wait a minute, you guys have it all wrong. So at that point I began to distrust what the hell was going on in the media. So um, now like again, I'm a crazy motherfucker, man. I believe in the, the, the craziest shit. <laughs> I believe that, I believe trends in, in, in all of them, not just Hip hip hop is the most obvious one. That's the most obvious. You look at hip hop today, Takashi Six Nine. You look at that shit. What they're promoting? They're promoting. They want. They're, he's always in his Instagram. He always has stacks of cash, and he's always like making it rain in every Instagram video. He's just throwing cash around, talking all sorts of shit. The baddest cars, talking shit on like, on his watches. Like that's the biggest thing going around right now, and they're pushing the shit out of that. They ain't stopping that. It's not like the music's that good. He's he's all right. When do but you find pushing time to watch shit? this shit? Because I ain't got time to watch <laughs> Instagram. Shit. You're not on Instagram? I won't even watch that shit if you paid me. Yeah. It's fascinating. I wouldn't even know it's not fascinating. To me, it is. Fucking, you got to be crazy to watch that shit. Especially after you said it, that you were young and that's what you thought. I was the same. I'm not watching it on liking it. I'm watching it in disgust. When I was 20, I wanted to be Pablo Escobar. There was no way I was exactly. getting a day job. I wasn't getting no fucking day job. My plan was to get somebody to rob him to get 200,000 cash. You were influenced by the media and, and Scarface. There, no, no, no. I was influenced by my childhood. There was no Scarface. By the time Scarface came, I was already robbing bitches. <laughs> so get that together. That was 83. <laughs> what about by 83, the, the I was Godfather. already robbing. Rob- no, but no, 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 no. I was never influenced by nothing like that. I was influenced by my childhood. The people I was around when I was a childhood. Aerosmith did heroin, right? Yeah, yeah. And and what year was their first album? Uh, 69, 70, 71. How old were you in 69? I was six. Okay. I didn't even know about Aerosmith. Uh, you, may, you, may, you may have been influenced by no, music. No, 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 no. I, we were talking about this the other day. I didn't like white music. I didn't start listening to white music. Would you li- what would you listen to? Black music, Spanish music. Okay. I didn't like rock music. When I was going to Catholic school and all that shit, Rock music was not on my agenda. Zeppelin, no <laughs> no Black Sabbath, nothing like that. I was listening to Top 40, Elton John. Do you remember your first taste of uh, the harder stuff? Musically? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was it? Zeppelin 2. Someone pulled out, pulled it out at a friend's house? At a house? party. Somebody pulled out Zeppelin 2. And you said, what the fuck? Really? <laughs> no. Then I got <laughs> high and listened to it. Then I got So high. you thought it was kind of interesting the first time. Like, I what was, is this it was shit? interesting. And then you got the high. Zeppelin was interesting. Ted Nugent was interesting. Uh, Free For All, that album, Free For mm-hmm. All, was interesting. Aerosmith Rocks was very interesting to me. 
I was still a little off. But once you started smoking weed. Once I started smoking weed at 12 or 13, I would find the time to get high and listen to those albums. Mm. How, was, how old are you at this point? 13, 14, okay. 12, yeah. 15, 15. I was into the Eagles, Ted, Zeppelin Heavy. You, know, you were blossoming. I was blossoming. But by that time already, the criminality in my life had started blossoming early because it was nothing. It was nothing. You know, I was telling somebody that when I lived on Given That Terrace where I found my mother on the floor, across the street from us was a house. And the guy that owned the house rented it out. And he rented it every two years. And somebody knew him. One time he rented it. And we were outside playing when the first kids came, when the two kids came and they had a boy and a girl and the family unloaded the truck and they got back in the truck and when they left, I still remember us playing whatever we were playing on the street going, let's go. And we broke into the house and we took shit and I took the stereo. He had a badass Fisher stereo <laughs> with the speakers, the Blau Punk, the whole fuck, I don't even know, Blau Punk, they car speakers, but he had like the whole Fisher. In those days, Fisher was Fisher big. was the shit. That was my Fisher stepdad's was the stereo. Shit. And if you had the, if you had the three and one, you it was still solid, but you were a punk in my neighborhood. You had to have components in my neighborhood. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Salud. <laughs> ah, those are those chia seeds. Is from the something health food wrong? Store. Like, why are you Bless farting you. so much recently? Because I eat a lot healthier, so I eat a lot of chia seeds and fucking goju <laughs> berries and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to put the pieces together. You, anyway, but, so. The criminality with me started early. It started early. You know, you could steal, you could do whatever, and it was accepted. You follow me? So, Dude, I was stealing when I was a kid. Right, so it yeah, was accepted. I, I, yeah. So once, before my mother died, I had done a couple creepy things. Nothing too creepy, like bicycle shit like that. That I didn't need to do. I didn't need to do that punk ass shit, but I liked it. I liked it. And then after she died, it was part of the excuse to become a criminal. So no, no, all that shit. That was the easiest thing in the world, was robbing drug dealers. It's the easiest thing in the world. Did I tell you the story about robbing the church? Yeah, yeah, Did I tell yeah, you? yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, you do all this creepy shit, it's if you continue to do it. Like, yeah. if you continue to do it in your 40s and 30s and I was 20s, 12. Yeah, when you have a fucking problem. And I stole, like, $14. Yeah, no, no, no. no. How, you know, like, now you have a, a boy, a little boy. What are you going to tell him? You know, yeah. he's gonna come to you one day. Like already, I feel like a hypocrite in a lot of stages of my life. But I'm gonna tell her the truth eventually. She's gonna find out the truth eventually. Yeah, you know, she's gonna listen to your old podcast. Yeah, oh please. <laughs> can you imagine finding these things as a as a daughter when your dad passes mm. and listening to each of them being hooked on them like you're addicted to a fucking uh, Netflix TV show, <laughs> like you binge listen. People do that now. Right. They get on podcasts and they binge listen. They'll listen to all the way back to one, to the beginning of the library. You know, it's fucking crazy. Man, podcasts are huge for, for people that work in places where they let them wear headsets. You know what I mean? You let them work with a, like at a post office or something. Man. I'll tell you, there was a thing in Time Magazine, the 50 podcasts to listen to. Time Magazine. And it was pretty fucking interesting. Did they throw J JRE in there? No. No. No, I, I didn't get to it. I didn't get to it. It was more about instructional type podcasts and mm -hmm. things you could learn. And a thing about English language from a British woman is the most popular podcast lately. Just it's just amazing where the growth has gone to. You know, like, it's in uh, Time Magazine. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I follow Time on Twitter. Yeah. So whatever Twitter puts up from Time, that's what I fucking read. <laughs> so lately, you've been getting into comedy. We were talking about getting high before comedy. That. You're done with that shit. Yeah, you know, um, you can't do something under pressure that you're not that good at high. You know, for you, I recommend uh, if if you want to inhale some cannabis and do a certain activity, and uh, it matters. You know, like getting on stage matters because if you suck, you're gonna eat a lot of dicks. So it does matter, and there's pressure. If you're not really that good at it hold off on smoking weed get a set 
master it, be super smooth. And then when you're really, really confident, then if you want to get high, get high. That, that's what I'm going to do. I, don't, I'm, I, I got stoned my first eight sets, um, but um, you know, I had mixed results. But I, it's hard to uh, put pieces together of your comedy when they're not, even, they're not even tight to begin with and you're trying to tie them together and then you add a bone rip before. You can't do it. So I decided maybe five sets ago to try going on stage uh, uh, without smoking. Man, it was, it's, I've gotten a lot better. So I'll come back and throw some weed on, on top of it once I get good. But for the meantime, uh, going on stage just, you know, totally straight is the best thing for me right now. I had to think about it when you guys were here talking. I think the first time I got on stage and tried it, Well, the first time I got on stage was July 18th of 91. And then in April, uh, St. Patty's Day of 92, I hosted a show with two local comics in Denver. I did some blow, and it was god-awful. And I was like, wait a second. Cocaine is the chatty drug. That's the one that makes you fucking talk and talk about fucking stories and get all philosophical and shit. If I ate a bag of dick on that shit, yeah. what am I going to do on reefer that makes you kind of introverted? Yeah. So I never really fucked with them. Yeah. And I didn't fuck with them until I got to the comedy store. And then at the comedy store one night, I smoked some reefer. And I went on stage, and I, like a prime spot, and I just died. Mm. It was lights out. It was lights out. Well, well, do you have to do like a different type of set? Because at that Belly Room show, we had some of those mints. And I didn't do the set I had planned on doing at all. But like, like, and I even forgot. Like, I forgot. I like, I just kind of went on and on in one of the jokes because I was stoned. But it went, it went better than some of my other high sets if you just go with it. Now here's the deal. See, there's 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 a lot of different paths to the story. There's a lot of different paths to the story. If you're going up in front of an A crowd at an A time, and you really need this set, I suggest you don't fucking get high. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's what I did. <laughs> So I'm the type of guy, if I lose at something, I come back the next day and I try it again. So like that time at the store, I came back the next day, it was like a Sunday, which it didn't matter. And I wanted to get high again and try it. And this time I killed. So here's the conclusion, guys. You ready for this? Let's say you're doing a spot at the fucking fourth wall or you're doing a spot somewhere in the valley. It don't matter. You're trying one particular joke and you're doing longer than five minutes. Try smoking some pot, because it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. So you might as well come up that way, try smoking some yeah. pot. But when you do the serious rooms for money, and you're getting paid, and you got a door deal, and it depends, and you're really trying to put a set together, then don't get high. That's it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Are you still going to drink alcohol? Yeah, yeah, you know. You know, I quit drinking for a while, but, you know, now I, I got to have a, a drink before I get on stage just to loosen me up just a little bit. I don't get hammered and go on stage because that could be a disaster. Just have just one drink, loosens me up, maybe a little cup of coffee. Dog, I've seen people get fucked up on stage, and it works for some people, and it doesn't work for some people. But I will tell you one thing. You're not going to be consistent. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It just you, you, You're smart enough, like... A, an uh, eighteen-year-old child will say, "You don't know what you're talking about." Yeah. An adult will say, "You won't be consistent. There's no way. It's like doing anything." Yeah. At fifty percent. Yeah, you can't be drunk. You can't on be stage. drunk. No. Or, or none of that shit. I, no. I, you know. So whoever's listening to this, don't listen to this the wrong way. Don't take this the wrong way. No, I, I'm not uh, condoning this at all. It's great every once in a while when you mm -hmm. listen. Me, you, and fucking Lee take a ride to where, where do people ski up here? Big Bear. Big Bear, and they do comedy up there. And we're getting a hundred dollars a piece, and we're each driving the car, and we get like a free meal. We get high, we get high. Who gives a fuck? Yeah. We eat, smoke a joint before we get back in the car, and we do some comedy. It's a blast. But man. you're so goddamn seasoned, and you're such a veteran. Oh no, you it's could different. get you yes. could get a high. You got you've been doing this for twenty years. Uh, when you're first starting, you gotta get your shit together first. You gotta get that. What's well, like me with jujitsu? Yeah, already same thing. When I go to jujitsu, I cannot be high. Hell at no! All. Not when you're starting. I gotta pay attention to every detail. I gotta see that collar. I gotta see that fucking cross. I gotta see everything. Yeah. I cannot get high, 
And that getting high gives me fear. It adds a quality of fear to me. Yeah. It doesn't let me go for things. It won't. If you mount me, I panic. I'll tap. My breathing changes. Yeah. My breathing gets shallow. Because I'm not, you know, it's a different level. I'm not ready. My tools aren't. I'm far from being at that level of being able to get high and fucking roll around with something. I'm far, far, far from that level. So you'll get there. Comedy is the same thing. Uh, it's deal. the exact same thing. I compare comedy to jiu-jitsu to an art. It's an art. That's it. Doesn't fucking matter how you look at it. Comedy is a fucking art. And you're going to learn something every time you go on the mat. Every time you touch that microphone, you're going to learn something. It's the same way every time you touch that mat. You're going to guarantee learn something. Yeah. Somebody's going to come up to you and say, dog, put your foot that way from now on when you do that sweep. And you're going to go, oh, shit. Look at me now. And yeah. I'm happy I came to class. Yeah. That's the best when you don't want to do something. When you're sitting on your couch on a Tuesday night, you're like, Fuck. I got to drive up here for fucking 40 bucks and a cheeseburger yeah. and do a set. God damn it. Why did I agree to this shit? I want to sit home and give mama the high hard one and watch fucking NYPD Blue on fucking whatever. Next thing you know, you go to that gig and guess what? There's an agent there. Plus you killed. Plus the headliner didn't show up. So you picked up $100 that the headliner was going to get. You know, and you're like, fuck. What would have happened if I would have sat on the couch tonight? Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. I would have got my dick sucked, and I would have had the same result. Look, I went to that shitty room. I ended up picking a buck forty up. Plus, I picked up an agent. Plus, I picked up another gig because the MC books a fucking night in fucking uh, San Fernando Valley. I mean, that's what happened. The same thing happened to jujitsu. There's nights you don't want to go to jujitsu. There's days I'm like, fuck, I got to do this, and then go to jujitsu. And you go to jujitsu, and it's you and him, or you and a purple belt, and he teaches you shit, and he beats the fuck out of you. That's the best class you've had in a long fucking time. Yeah. Same thing. What's up, EB? How's that little <laughs> breath? That little breath meant hit you a little bit, didn't it? Uh, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Sure. I can see it in your fucking I eyeballs. Think, I'm not sure if it was that, that or the bomb. Craig? I feel the same way. <laughs> time for Breeze. Oh, shit. <laughs> we have one shit. of those. Yeah, I'll take, take one to go. Take two. There you go. What the fuck? Will you ready? I'm, I'm, I'm for Breeze, I'm, though. I'm, 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 I'm for Breeze, though. Yeah, fuck you. Yeah. You fucking stuff, you <laughs> cocksucker. How do you, I mean, are you in love with comedy right now? I love it, man. I love it. Especially when it goes good. Like the, la the, the show in Frisco, we did a belly room show before Frisco. That's the first show I did not high. And that was the best show up to, up to that point. So I thought, okay, cool. We're going to, me and Sam are going to go up to Frisco and then Sacramento. I was going to do the same thing. No weed the whole day. Nothing went on stage. In, at Cobb's in San Francisco, it was better than the, the, the set at the Belly Room. Then, you know, we went to Sacramento. And it, Sacramento was special because I tell people when they ask me about comedy, like, wh what's the, what's the, you know, like, what do you like about it? And I, and, I, and I tell them, I love working in front of Latin crowds. I love that because then you could just talk about your experiences growing up as a Mexican, you know, and, and uh, when I did, when I opened for you, I think four different times, you bring in all the Mexicans. I love working Mexican rooms. I love it. I feel really comfortable. And I also look love working in front of uh, uh, the Tinfoil Hat Comedy Night people where everybody's like, you know, on the same page. Those are my two favorite cr crowds. Um, <clears throat> I, I love it. I, I have, uh, it's so much goddamn fun. Because at Jiu Jitsu, well, when I first did comedy back in uh, 2001, before 10th Planet, before 10th Planet, I went up and I did open mic nights at the comedy store like maybe 10 times or something like that. Mm, there were like mixed results. But I knew, because I was already a brown belt in jiu-jitsu, I knew that comedy was just like jiu-jitsu. I'm like, damn, you can't just go up there and just talk shit like, like you can in the locker room at school. You have to have work ethic and write, practice and go out three, four nights a week just like jiu-jitsu. I knew, I'm like, damn, I could do this, but I'd have to have a, because I didn't have any public speaking experience other than DJing at a strip club, and that's not real, but, but like real public speaking experience, I didn't have any of that. So I was, I knew I was gonna, I needed a lot of work, so then, 
you know, I was writing with Joe. We had all these sketches. We wanted to pitch a, a sketch comedy show back then. And then he ended up getting uh, signed by Comedy Central to do the man show after t uh, Adam Carolla and Jimmy Kimmel left. Him and Doug Stanhope came in and did the comedy, uh, uh, did uh, the man show. And I came in as Joe, one of Joe's writers because we were already writing a bunch of sketches. We had like 30 sketches ready to go. We were trying to do like a Dave Chappelle type show. And I... I Music has always been number one to me, so I, comedy was just like something that I was that I loved, but music was always number one. So I decided at that point, you know what, I don't have time to put into stand up comedy and, and uh, it's too much work, but I'll, I'll help Joe write some sketches. I go, that was cool. So, um, working at Comedy Central sucked, I hated it so much. It was, it's a lot, that's an hour story, it was terrible. So, during work, as I was working. On the Man Show, I went to Brazil and did Abu Dhabi 2003. I beat Hoyler Gracie, who at that point was, you know, the, the god of the featherweight division. Nobody even scored a point against him. He won three years in a row. I tapped him out. It was in Brazil. It was, a, it was a, you know, the biggest upset in jiu-jitsu history at that point. And then I came back. I said, fuck comedy. I'm gonna just going to teach jiu-jitsu, you know, until my music blows up. That's what I thought, you know, because it was always about the music. So... I walked, I called Joe, I'm like, thank you for fucking b fighting for me and getting me the job, but you know, I don't want to work there. I'm done with that shit. I've seen Hollywood and I'm like, I don't want nothing to do with Hollywood, even today. Don't want to do, that's bullshit. It was, it was a horrible experience. Well, anyways, so I opened up 10th Planet, but I never stopped writing. I would always write and I would always had the habit of, you know, if I come up with an idea, I'd write and I have so many notes and I thought maybe in a couple years I'll go back and, and try some stand up again. And then it was five years and it was seven years and it was eight years and then it was 10 years and then it was like 15 years and I still hadn't gone back but I had all these ideas. So then I just decided, you know, last year I thought maybe teaching jujitsu was enough public speaking experience because I'd always try to do stand-up as I teach. You know, I do seminars. I never start a seminar with, a, a, you know, right away and get into techniques. I always like bullshit for about five minutes. And then sometimes some stand-up comes up, you know what I mean? So I, I, was, I was wondering if that would translate. Was 15 years of that, would I be able to get up on stage at the comedy store and be better than I was back then when I was doing open mics and I totally sucked? So that was always in the back of my mind. So I decided to do it. I told Sam... I knew Sam before 10th Planet. I knew Sam back in the day when I met you, before 10th Planet. I knew you before 10th Planet wasn't even a thought. So he, you know, he was doing Comedy Chaos and, I, and we were all into conspiracy theories together. So he put me up uh, on a Tuesday night and it was the first time in 15 fucking years. So I went up there and out of all the, the first 10 sets, that was actually the best one. Because right when I got up there, I had the mic and I'm like, whoa. Because my students, when I at school, when I start to tell a story, a lot of them are like, Coach, let's fucking start. It's 9-10. I'm bombing every night in jiu-jitsu. I bomb. They don't want to hear my shit. They want to do jiu-jitsu. And I try to tell a story. And I got to censor myself because I don't want to be too crazy. And they're always, I'm bombing every night. I don't have a mic. So when I got on stage at the comedy store, like the first five seconds, I'm like, I have a mic. This is just like a seminar. And they're drunk. They don't want to do jiu-jitsu. And they want to laugh. To me, I felt right away like, oh shit, this is easy. I got a fucking mic. I'm used to doing this shit without a mic. It's like, fuck, it's like steroids and shit. You know the what I mean? The microphone is a different control, ain't it? Yeah, I was like, I think it's, it's a different control. Yeah. People do not understand. Yeah. That's why people say to you, well, do some time at the club. Go up on stage and do eight minutes. And you're like, I don't have a microphone. You don't need a microphone. Shut the fuck you up. You fucking do need one. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. The microphone is the tool of tools. If there's a microphone on stage and you go up there and start on the microphone for three minutes, but then you want to walk away from the stage, that's one thing. That's one thing. Walking away from the mic and talking to the audience, that might be funny sometimes. But to go up there nude without a microphone, you lose your shield. Yeah. It's really your shield. It's the power. So your sword is your brain and your arm and everything. But this microphone, when you grab it, it's your shield. It centers you. Even okay. if you don't need it. You don't need it. You don't need it. You're as tough as nails. But it centers you. It balances you. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it's kind of weird not to have a microphone and then to have a microphone. Yeah. So, tr so 
teaching. Now you learn that in jujitsu. Yeah. I learned that motherfucker on stage. Yeah. At a place in Craig, Colorado. No mic? No mic. And it says before, when you get the paperwork, it would say this is a violent room. If shit erupts, run off to go to your room and call the management. And it had the reason why the room was so bad, Eddie, it was because they had a mic, but you were far away from the audience. Yeah. That's another learning thing. If you go into a room and they're like, yeah, you stand there, but they're 30 feet away. Uh-uh. Yeah, that's Get great. those people up or put me in the audience or get off the stage when the owner's not watching and go into the audience. All these things are control mechanisms that people do not know until they work without them. And then you're like, oh, now I know why I got a microphone. Mm-hmm. That's why the guy with the microphone always wins in a fucking club unless oh, you're brain dead. Yeah, yeah. Unless the comic's brain dead. Yeah. You should be able to destroy any The microphone, hardware. right. Yeah. But listen to what I'm saying to you. Going up without a microphone is completely different than going up with a microphone and walking away from it. Yeah, I'm, I do that every night, and I bomb every night. So it turns out that me teaching jiu-jitsu and trying to squeeze in some jokes to people that don't want to hear them it's like dragging logs up hills. It's like strength and conditioning. You know what I mean? So it actually translated. I didn't know if it was. I'm like, does 15 years of me trying to tell jokes without a mic to people that don't want to hear any fucking jokes. They give me a little laughter every now and then, but they're not into it. They want to train. Now, when John Jock taught, did he ever crack a joke from time to time? Every now and then. Yeah. yeah. They, you yeah. have to, as a teacher, yeah. you have to have yeah. some sense of humor to break the... Yeah the whatever yeah you know what i'm saying but in, in jujitsu uh, you don't have a mic they don't want to listen to it but the cool thing is they're not paying for you to be funny so you don't have to be funny so you could just the the jokes are like you know that's just uh um frosting on the cake you know icing on the cake um that makes it a little easier because you don't have to be funny you know and in seminars they they want five minutes of your thoughts they do you they don't you don't want to start out of a three-hour seminar okay grab a partner grab his left arm put him in spider web and go no, you want to and and sometimes you know it's not always jokes sometimes i do five minutes on the background of the techniques we're about to get into there's a story then i'll tell a story that leads into that's why we're doing spider web you know what i mean like um but it's it's uh the public speaking practice that uh, really helped. What's the organization that you uh, join if you want to learn how to speak publicly? And you Toastmasters. Oh. Never heard of it. Is it Toastmasters? Yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. Let me oh. see. Look it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What Just, is that? Well, I live, you know, it's so weird that we they teach you how to make toasts at like weddings and shit, so you're not so uncomfortable. Right? Is that what it is? It's, it sounds like what it is. I don't know. No, no, no. I because everybody, everyone at some point got to give a toast. You know, at when weddings. I lived, when I lived in Bold, I was in the transition period before I got arrested, before I kidnapped Baluch. I was in the real transition period. I was doing well, Eddie. I was really doing well. Financially, I wasn't getting rich. But from where I came from, I was doing tremendous. And all I had to do was go to this place every day and sell cars. I was doing great, Eddie. So I lived with a chick that was a redheaded chick. That had big tits and a big red ass. And her mother owned a printing <laughs> store in Boulder. And she was young. She, If I was 20, when did I get arrested? At least 87. So I was basically 87. 23? What's, the, no. Three and four. I was 24 years old when I got arrested for kidnapping. So what is Toastmasters? It just says, on the, uh, do you want to become a confident public speaker? So I lived with a chick and a geeky guy. Right. The chick sold pot and had cats. And the guy, like when you walked in the guy's room to talk to him, he had a picture of a testarossa on his wall. He had his goals written everywhere. He was an Anthony Robbins guy. He believed in the other guy. He was into everybody. This poor bastard spent all his money on just trying to be a better person, like all that stuff, like going to, what do they call those things? Not get rich seminars, but the other ones. Self-improvement? Like self-improvement. That's And he was young, guys. If I was 24, he was like 23. And this is all he'd talk about. But he used to go to this. He used to wake up once a week or once a week, a month or twice a month, and you go to this shit early and you talk. 
And he would say to me, dog, I don't know, man. I don't know. You're a lot better at this. Can you help me with this? And I would ask him what it would be. And I wasn't even doing stand-up then. I wasn't even doing stand-up then. I'd just crack jokes and fuck around the living room at night with these guys. But he was going to this because of his fear of talking in public. And he wanted to improve. Mm. And hear you, and even Lee, for example. I've thrown Lee up in some weird situations. Mm. And he's reacted positively. Like, most people would go, I can't do that and run out of the fucking room. You guys, I applaud you. Because I remember you going on stage at the comedy store. I brought you up in 2001 on Sunday nights. On yeah, Sunday, Sunday nights. nights. Yeah, yeah, I brought you up a few times. Yeah. I think you even showcased for Mitzi one night. I know uh, um, Damon Wayans was there one night on a Sunday when I went up, and I it was probably the worst set ever. You know, <laughs> it's just it's the public speaking experience that really helps, man. Because, uh, you know, and the crowd, the crowd's huge too. Because, like I was saying in Sacramento, they were all Mexican and they were all conspiracy theorists. So it was fucking. It was so much fun, man. It was so much goddamn fun. I loved it. I mean, you know, here's the fucking craziest thing. I was thinking about the uh, Spanish scene. When I first moved to LA, the Spanish scene here was going to be the next big thing. And they couldn't put it together. You know, George hated this guy. He hated this guy. He hated this guy. But it didn't bother me. And I'll tell you why. Believe it or not, Eddie, I would bomb in front of Spanish audiences. Mm. In those days, if you watch me on K Loco, and all those Spanish shows. Were you too dirty? Oh, no. Was it? Oh yeah. They didn't. They didn't oh, want. No. They didn't want to go too you deep. Know, Rudy would tell, pull me on the side and tell me, if you work my rooms, you got to work them a little cleaner. Show these people, all the Mexicans, they don't like dirty material. You know, he would always get on me. Willie Barcena would get on me. A lot of Latino comics would get on me. Would you change your material? Not even mm-hmm. fucking close. I would go up there and work even dirtier. <laughs> and he stressed it. Rudy stressed it. And then one night, do you remember Marilyn Martinez? God yeah. Rest, he yeah. had a gig out of town. And Marilyn and me did it. And Marilyn was up. Bro, I wasn't even there yet. As I got up, I saw the 20 cop cars outside. Marilyn got into it with a fucking woman. The lady said something to some guy. The guy said something to her. The woman said something. Then they started throwing chairs. It was called the Brave Bull. In uh, one of those little Spanish towns. Yeah, you know, Brave like, Bull, man. My 30, mom used to go there. Yes, <laughs> Whittier Brave or Bull. something like that. It was phenomenally. The My Brave, mom parties. <laughs> the Brave Bull had maybe three comedy rooms. Oh, wow. It was huge. It was a Mexican fucking restaurant, bar, grill, entertainment, wedding, quinceanera. I mean, you'd go there and anything was going down. It was a complex. You know how many times I went there and wherever the fuck it was and I was in a different room to do comedy? Like, I still remember being there with George Lopez and Pablo Francisco on a Saturday Oh, night. shit. I and love we, Pablo. We were in a room that had animal heads, like goat's heads and fucking bull, like oh, the, shit. the hunter room, like the yeah. guy hunted them all down, like one of those rooms. There was a room. Chupacabra in the, head. Bro, it was crazy, that place. And he would give me work in the winters. They paid forty dollars a set on Friday and Saturday. In the summers it went down to twenty five. <sighs> That's nothing. <laughs> that was nothing. That's still. But nothing. I didn't give a fuck. I would yeah. drive down there for the small fifty. Yeah. Do the comedy store Friday and Saturday. And in those days, you did uh, Universal City on Fridays for two hundred. Mm. At some point, but you just bombed. You just went up there to bomb. It was a dance club, and they stopped the music. Coming to the stage, <laughs> comedian Eddie Bravo, and you walk, and they're like, "Terrible idea!" Oh, horrible! But for two hundred on a Friday night, shit, I'll mug your mother. For two hundred from ten to eleven on a Friday night, and I can still make my store and still buy a package, because now I can get a package. That fucking drive down to fucking the comedy store from Universal's is tip top Maguna. You're whistling. <laughs> <laughs> Tony Bennett, cocksucker. Let me give some shout outs to my man, Tommy Poro, Joe Gee, One Scully One, Brian Michaels, DJ Miami Joe, Lorenzo Christopher, and Jeffrey Tollison. I love you, motherfuckers. 
Don't forget July 7th, working out with Uncle Joey at the Ice House. July 13th and 14th, I'm at the South Point Casino in Las Vegas. Friday and Saturday, 7.30 show. You're out of there by 9. You're eating your wife's muffler by 10.15. You understand me? And then, boom, we close out the month of July with Salt Lake motherfucking city. Wise guys, four shows, two Friday, two Saturday, no fucking drama. Working on new material, getting my shit together, and that's it. Fucking August, we go to Kansas City. We go to fucking uh, uh, Nashville, and we go to the other place, too. So get ready. Details coming. Alabama? Soon. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to Alabama, and I'm going to fucking uh, Nashville. Boom, Nashville, last week of August. So get ready, cocksuckers. But that's it, and that's that. No, it was a fun time at Calusa Casino. If you came, thank you. Thank you for the confidence builder. Uh, the fucking food is great there. The hotel, the best shower. Number two to the South Point, the casino. <laughs> you know, you I, are you know things that you showers. like about places. Oh my god! I what is it? Is it a lot of? Shower. Is it a lot of heads or what does it do? Space heads, and the tub is brilliantly. Mm-hmm. It's not metal. It's that plastic stuff, but it's curved like a like a chair that you watch TV in. Okay. Oh. Oh my god! And they have three nozzles: one that shoots at your balls. <gasps> The other one hits your stomach, and the other one hits your face. So let me explain something. How's the temperature control? Oh, listen to me. I had the air conditioning down to 55. I had the fireplace on, the portable fireplace, because that's how I roll. You understand me? I want heaven and hell. I want heat and fucking cold. And then I got back from the show last night, maybe 10 o'clock. I ordered a little something, something. I had a little snacky poo. Let me tell you something. I took my anabolic fucking over-the-counter sleeping pill. I, ca- I popped a couple fucking anxiety tablets. About 10.30, I went into the fucking shower last night like a doctor. I said, I'm going to take a shower because I hugged a couple people and shit. I want to take the germs off my neck. I said, let me get to take a shower and I go to the casino and gamble a little bit. Dog, I went in there about 10.30. Guess what? I woke up in that motherfucker at 12.20. <laughs> Woke up. What do you mean you woke up? I passed out there. <laughs> Where? In the tub. <laughs> with my mouth open. I almost drowned, but I didn't give a fuck, Jack. Oh, I thought you were in the casino. I slept in the tub for an hour. For almost two hours, I slept in that tub. The <laughs> hot water hit me from all angles. The best shower in the country I've been to. Second best to the South Point Casino. The pimp room. At the South Point Casino, the shower is the size of this room. <laughs> and you got nozzles everywhere with a chair. So you just put the nozzles on, and you sit on the chair like this, like Copernicus, <laughs> naked, and you let that water hit you for an hour. Ooh. No wonder you don't answer your phone that weekend. Oh, no. You don't hear from me at all. I get up at 4 in the morning just to take a shower until 5, then I order room service like a doctor. Come on, dog. Copernicus. And I pay the two fifty to fucking smoke in the room because it's like the Sinatra suite. <laughs> So if I'm going to pay two fifty, I'm smoking like a chimney. You understand me? Do you prepay? I'm in there lighting fires and shit. I don't give a fuck. You Jack. prepay the fine? Yeah, just take the fine. Take the two and a half because I'm smoking. I'm not leaving the room. <laughs> That's how you do it, Doug. Why fuck around? So they always, they're always charging you, right? Every yeah. Time you're no, no. I don't do it a lot of hotels because you can't do it. You got to be polite. There's kids in the hotels. But the South Point, they put me up on top in the top yeah. fucking room. All the way in the corner. The room is huge. So I could smoke in the bathroom and fucking, you know, the bat like like the, I could smoke in the shower. You know how many times I've gone in the shower with a joint and turned the shower and I sat in Kelly Corner? <laughs> fucking smoke a joint and then bang one out. Come on my feet. You know how fun that is? <laughs> when you come on your feet and just sit there and watch it, it's on your fungi toe. You don't give a fuck. <laughs> or how about when you come like like the sink is kind of clogged and it goes up to your ankles and you come and then you have come on your ankles because <laughs> yeah, it's good for your skin. You rub it into your feet. Your feet get slippery. Never had any of these problems. Just Never? don't stand up because no. the tub gets you don't, slippery. You don't jerk off in the shower? No. Oh, that's your problem. That's your problem. That's when men jerk off. You lay back and you bang one out like a fountain. Some of it lays on your stomach. Some of it lays on your thighs. You scratch it off. Uh, you got like that little stickum. Remember the stickum spray they had in the 80s, the Pittsburgh Steelers? Yeah. <laughs> it's like stickum. Anything sticks to your leg. Eddie Bravo, it's amazing the fucking journey we've both seen ourselves do. You know, it really is. I still remember sitting with you in Houston's. Remember, we used to go to Houston's all the fucking time. And we'd do that. Uh, the videos there. What was that Houston's. called again? Wait, it was. 
Ten Planet Kush. Yes, Ten Planet Kush. That's right. Ten Planet Kush. They're still on YouTube. You can Ten still watch Planet those. Ten Planet Kush. Things. We used to go to Uf fucking... UFC uh, predictions. UFC predictions. Yeah. Ten Planet Kush. We did about like twenty. We would five meet of them. before you get on the plane. Yeah. Like we would, you would stop and meet me on the way to the plane. Yeah. Me, you, Dan Hardy did one. Yep. Yeah. A couple of us did like some great the fucking that Mexican food. I talked to those guys. Yeah. For years after they closed, I kept in touch with one of the cooks. How? On the phone. He would call me from time to time. You That's know, how much we liked them and they liked me. Why yeah. did you have his number? Because he was family. I would call him up to see if he was working. We did most of them at Houston's bar. At Houston's. At Houston's. And generally, you, you'd make like about five predictions and you would get, you know, sometimes three rides, sometimes two It rides. didn't matter. You, ne you, you never killed at all except... The one time we decided to do it at your house, and then I ended up videotaping all your cats, and I made like all the cats were around videotaping them. You're, you're giving me each story on each cat, and you know, uh, you know their personalities and their background and all that shit. And for some reason, with all those cats, there was like something in the air, man. When you were ready to go, and I and I turned on the camera, and you went, and it was um, Ten Planet Kush, I think episode twenty. It's the one with all the cats. That one, there was some electricity in the air, man. You were on fire. It was one take. We said go, and you nailed every fight, every fight you had right. And I remember driving home. I couldn't wait to edit it because I knew that it was something super special about it. I didn't know you, obviously I didn't know you were gonna nail every fight, but that one, just with all the cats, and I don't know, maybe maybe it's true. Maybe, you know how they say that a cat's purr uh, generates positive energy that you could pick up, you know what I mean? That's what you know, crazy cat ladies say. I felt something, all those cats were all around and, and they all, you could see their personalities, and then you picked up Fidel. You picked them up and we start the, the the previews or the predictions. He loved the camera. That motherfucker yeah. loved the camera. Though. Oh man, that's that's one of the greatest yeah, episodes he loved the ever. Camera. Fidel loved the fucking. <laughs> He'll get if you had a camera on. Fidel would fucking get up and walk into the frame. <laughs> like, What's up, motherfuckers? I'm here. I'm sag. <laughs> you, what up? <laughs> I'm sag. I'm thinking. I'd love to see. I'd love to see that actually. Like you, the, fast forward to the the part where you give the predictions because you were on fucking fire with the, you it was so funny and it was the only one most of them when i was filming them you would say like two or three things that were funny and i'm i'm videotaping and you could hear me laugh this one i was laughing the whole way through i couldn't stop laughing you were just it was like one it was like when you went up in columbus that one time when you opened for joe and he was filming that uh, monkeys in space thing when you went up i'll never forget ever watching from the side stage you were sweating and spitting and everybody was dying you were crushing like it was just gold it was like fire it was like you just you you just had magic that night it was crazy man i'll never forget that night all those years opening up for joe yeah. were fucking magical it was like crazy magical. Like crazy. Me and Joe were always on the side, the just on the floor. <laughs> the education was mind-boggling. Joe doesn't know that I took his book. Like, John Jock gave you his black belt. Joe gave me his black belt. And I just tweaked a couple elements that now we both live by. We both do. Like, I used to tell him for years, Joe, we got to leave early on Sunday. Fuck that. I'm not getting up till one, and I would fucking leave the night before. I'm stranded. <laughs> I would fuck with his emotions and shit until he fucking listened. Dog, you got kids. You got to be back on the first flight. They don't want you. Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah. I'm going to fucking get up at 10 and eat breakfast, and the yeah. flight's delayed. My seminars are on yeah. generally on Saturday, and right when I'm done with that afternoon seminar, I'm yeah. on my way to the airport. Five o'clock. I'm back on... at home Saturday night with yeah, my family. No, 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 no. Yeah. It's. Uh, I don't have time for vacation. It's anymore. really weird how that was that was my apprenticeship. That's the true story. That's that's you know, when I write my book on comedy, it was ten years. Opening yeah. for Joe. That was crazy. I saw what a combo. I saw it from the beginning. I and then like every the now and then uh you know, they'd switch it up. Either Duncan would be the, the one who opened and, and and then you and then Joe or uh Ari, uh John Heffron even. But, uh, man, those are the days, man. Me? And what about when it was me and Ari and Duncan? Yeah. There were shows when it was me, Ari, 
Duncan, Red Band, you, Tate in the fucking audience, yeah, and Joe. You know, yeah. we go eat at fucking two in the morning, and Joe would pick up the. I mean, it was fucking craziness. Yeah. It was just pure. I remember renting a van in Austin. Yeah. I was single as fuck back then, so anytime Joe went on the road, he just dragged me along. You know what I mean? I went. I went on the. I wasn't even a comedian back then. I was just living the life of a comedian, but not getting on stage. I didn't get on but stage you were back watching. then. Watching. I was watching. But you were yeah. watching. Yeah. And that's time served. Yeah. In my world, like Lee. Uh, watching me going out, blah, 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 blah. That's time served. Yeah. That's why. Uh, apprenticeship. Actually, that's apprenticeship. It's time served. You watched it. You've seen what happened. I've seen Joe's set probably 2,000 times, just over and over. I knew his set inside and out. You know, I wouldn't even listen to his jokes anymore. I would be fascinated by listen, uh, paying attention to the people that, there was always two or three people, maybe one that wasn't laughing at all. Everyone's dying. Joe's destroying, and and I always find the one dude who's not laughing at all. And he's usually with his wife, and he's just sitting like this. Just he he is not happy about his wife. Uh, another guy making his wife laugh. He's just like, man, wow, look at that guy. He's not laughing at shit. That guy. <laughs> I was fascinated with shit like that. There's nothing worse because you see it right away. You see it right away. It sticks out like a thumb. When a woman is a fan of your comedy and her husband isn't a fan of anything, he's just a pukey guy that's a hater. Yeah. And, in fact, she's paying for the tickets. Yes, she dragged him out. She dragged him out. He didn't want... And she's laughing at every shit that isn't even jokes. She's just like, can't wait to laugh. <laughs> and the guy is furious. Yes. And I saw it over the years. The, 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 the worst one I ever saw was Ontario. Ontario was the worst one I ever saw. When I went up first, and the guy was heckling, and I said something to him, and then the guy got really pissed. Then when Joe went up, he started heckling Joe right off the fucking bat, like something about a wig or something. I'll never forget that. This is 2000. This is the height of fucking Fear Factor. Yeah. And this guy's heckling Joe, and there was a big bouncer. Do you remember that guy in Ontario? I don't remember any bad. He was a steroid freak. I saw him years later and he was skinny. I go, what happened? Man, I had a heart attack. No shit. You were drinking that shit. Bro, he was yoked, this poor guy. Well, he got the guy and threw him out, but something happened outside. There was an ugly altercation. The cops came. The chick finally got up and went outside and she came back and started yelling. Something happened with the guy. They fucked him up before the cops got there or something. It was not bueno. But and then there was the time when I shot my special in Chicago. The guy in the front row that kept moving around and shit. Eddie, for two minutes I'm saying jokes. And I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to kick this guy in the face. <laughs> without nobody seeing it on tape. Just in my mind, I thought I could just kick him. And he would just drop. And I could just keep going and nobody would say nothing. Yeah. I've I I've seen that enough where like now when I'm on stage, if there's a like, you know, a girl sitting with a guy, I'll do my best to ignore that table. I don't even want I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable at all. You know, I just stare at nothing, you know. People you don't talk to the audience. You guys are well trained in that aspect. Like that's why I know you've both studied comedy. Because you don't talk to the audience. Like that's, asking them where they're from and what. Yeah, that's a habit do. you pick up in New York. Yeah, New that's York a good comics. way to get shit started, though. You know, no, I, it's I, not. No, it's not. I do that in in seminars. You know, sometimes I'll start a seminar. I'm like, where you? You know, I'll do a little of that, but I work the crowd, right? Uh, I haven't done it yet in uh, in real time. Since, no, I haven't. Really. Real time is a different fucking yeah. thing. Yeah, because if they don't say nothing to you, and that motherfucker goes silence, your heart stops and miss a beat. Like yeah. you're like, eh, eh, eh. And if you don't got anything funny to say off it, damn, you're 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 risking it. Boom! You asked them, you're trying to ask them some shit, and you can't even I'm, think I'm, of any I'm, funny I'm, shit. I'm leaving my leg up at Tenth Planet. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. like putting my leg up at Tenth yeah. Planet and saying, yeah. "Take my leg. I'm gonna block your fucking hip. You're not gonna yeah. do dick." It's uh, <laughs> jujitsu and stand up correlate so much. It's and I didn't know till I joined jujitsu, because right away I improved my comedy game. Improved. Right away, I saw a bunch of gaps in my hole, uh, a bunch of holes in my game. As soon as I was like six, seven months into jiu-jitsu, I had so many holes in my personal life that I couldn't imagine how many I had in my comedy game. So I started to fill those fucking uh, holes as much as I could. 
A, my fucking writing. But I think I'm starting to overwrite, dog. Why? I'm not because I'm not a writer. I'm the type of dude that goes out there with three sentences and just gets the party started with energy. Yeah. I'm trying to be something I'm not, and that's what happened. But bro, I learned a, you learn a lot from every time you shoot a special. I'm not good at shooting specials. I'm not a good special shooter. CDs, I'm not bad at. Specials, I'm not good at. I choke. There's pressure. You know, there's, it's, uh, it's no joke. There's, you know, nothing's guaranteed. But I really had nothing to lose on this Netflix thing. I had nothing to lose. It, maybe you're just being hard. Maybe it's amazing and you just, you're just hard on yourself. Maybe when you look back at it, <sighs> it's we'll not see. amazing. It's not amazing. They're going to make it look good. Make it sound good. But it's not going to be fucking what I really would could do, the damage I could hmm. do. Which, you know, and listen, you live and you learn, brother. 27 years, you're still living and learning. That's yeah. the beauty of this thing. Was it like the cameras, or what do, you th- what do you what do you think really affected you? It was me. The last two weeks, going into that last two weeks, I fucked up my mind a little bit. I did something I shouldn't have done. I went into a dark place instead of going into a better place. Purposely. Just to see where the... But it was too late to do that. I should have done that three or four weeks earlier. I decided to do that with a week left to go. Which wasn't good to do. There was a lot of mistakes I made. What I did was was go to places where I wasn't going to be liked. Where those jokes I say in front of a podcast guy will laugh because they know me from the podcast or from Joe's podcast. But I went to places that wouldn't know me. I wouldn't put myself on the schedule. Do you follow me? Yeah. So I saw what jokes the general public wasn't laughing at because I wanted to see what would appeal on Netflix. Mm. Because with Netflix, you're not doing a show for these people. You're doing a show for viewers. But that's what I thought. Mm. That's now, all bullshit. Now, you, now you've learned that you just got to... That's all bullshit. That's let all white, them catch up to... That's to, all white yeah. talk. Yeah. Just be funny. Yeah. That's all I had to be was be funny. So last night I did an hour and I still had another hour to go. I went up to my room and I go, what the fuck was that? Two weeks ago I couldn't even come up with 27 minutes. Couldn't even do 30. Didn't even have the confidence to do fucking 30 minutes. How long ago? Two weeks ago. Huh. June 4th. It's June 16th. And it was tremendous last night. Tremendous. Hmm. I was loose. I had a great time up on stage. So you live and you learn, people. You're not fucking perfect. At least you're strong enough to say the truth and not dismiss everything. That 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 helps comedy a lot, is being honest with yourself. That helps in every aspect. Yeah. Not just comedy, whether you're jiu-jitsu, whether you're a plumber, whether you're an author, whether you're a writer. It helps with every fucking degree that you have to look at yourself every six months and go, what the fuck am I doing wrong? You know. But sometimes you overanalyze that, and it kills what you're doing. Why ruin? Why are you dismissing what got you to the game? What got you to the dance? What's that expression? Why change it? You know. Yeah. Why change what got you to the dance? This is what got you to the dance. Now you want to be smart, and, and that's a mistake I've avoided for years. And this time I didn't avoid it. Hmm. When we get smart, Eddie, is when we fail. Stay stupid. When we're stupid, we do great. Is when <laughs> stay we stay stupid. Yeah, stay stupid. I have no problem with that. No, me neither. I'm a master of that. Me neither. <laughs> that's when we do our best work when we stay stupid. When we get smart and try to be geniuses, let me see what I'm doing. Mean, and that's when we fucking go, what the fuck did I just do? Then you're acting like Johnny White, my guy. You're acting like Johnny White, but I might as well go to Disney and stop people from having edibles. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you can't go in the park with a fucking edible. What do you give a fuck? Dog, when that guy came up to me and said that to me, that he followed me, and that I didn't go to my room, I was pissed. I was pissed. Yeah, you looked pissed. I didn't know what was going on because yeah. I was already through security. I was just like looking this, back on what? What the This fuck? does not look good. Dog, you failed the cop test. You failed the cop test. Now you're here breaking my fucking balls. At <laughs> That's what basically those guys are. They failed the test the first time. They didn't do enough push-ups. They didn't get a roast beef sandwich. <laughs> Who the fuck knows what the, the something didn't go right? They didn't pass the mental. You know what I'm saying? Disney don't do a mental. Who the fuck knows? I don't fucking know. But for them to act that way, that's the people that usually act that way. Or the people that got booted from something and now, you know, they couldn't be a cop for some reason. I'm Spanish. Mall cop. Yeah, (laughs) mall cop. I can't deal with that shit. This is what it is. You got a weapon? No. Then what do you give a fuck? If you ain't got a weapon, then what are you playing sheriff for? 
<laughs> if you got a gun or a machine gun, then I can see you stopping me. But if you ain't got a weapon, why are you playing fucking cop for? You get shot like the rest of us. They put you out here to fucking play a cop with no gun. And you're actually believing that shit. People are going to listen to you without a fucking gun. The fuck is wrong with people? <laughs> the fuck is wrong with people, Eddie Bravo? What are you doing stand-up again, Eddie? Um, right now, Live Nation uh, with Candace from... Uh, she used, Candace is uh, the one who put together uh, the San Francisco and Sacramento gig. She's my sister-in-law. She used to work for Live Nation. And uh, she still kind of works for him. And she... She's the one who presented the idea to the guy at the top. And he said, well, if they sell out San Francisco and Sacramento, we'll put them on, we'll get some more dates for them. And uh, San Francisco was, it, they were having a comedy festival that weekend. It was the worst weekend ever. And we still got 350 people in there and it's 400 capacity. Yeah, that's comms, yeah. Fuck yeah, you. so we great. got 350 and then Sacramento, we were Ten short of selling it out, in Sacramento. Both shows or just one show? We just did one show. We did one show each, uh, and Live Nations. They, they were, uh, I guess, they were satisfied because they're going to keep it going. We're we're, we're going to go to Philly, um, uh, Austin. I don't know. We're, we're so trying just, to figure it now, out. Now you do ten four comedy on yeah, the road. Yeah, ten four at comedy. Now when it's ten four comedy, do you do regular comedy? Or you just do comedy about. Aliens and fucking it's, Martians. It's just my regular set, but uh, my regular set is uh, a little. Uh, it's you know somewhere in between conspiracies and um, you know stories of me growing up. It's it's not all. It's it's I'm not preaching. It's actually I'm making more fun of more fun of tinfoil hack uh, conspiracy theories and actually pushing it. But you know, I just I didn't want to. Um be preachy and you know i just want to be you know just tell funny stories and it's hard it's hard making conspiracy theories funny but um i like doing comedy in front of a room where they're at least down with the tower seven conspiracy you know we call we call the shows tower seven and over you gotta at least be down because if you're way on the other side you ain't gonna laugh today. You ain't gonna like me. You might as well get that refund right now. So that's the whole point of it. It's just basically putting together a show where we're all on the same page. You know, I, you know, I don't care about making people, you know, the libtards laugh. I don't care about them at all. They can, they can watch uh, Jimmy Gaffigan or something. You know what I mean? He's awesome. I love him too. But you know, that's you know, that's generally not my crowd. I get you. I That's it. You. So we did Tin Four Hat Comedy Night just to attract. When I was listening to you, I was just thinking about what material I would do on Tin Four. What is it? Tin Four Hat. Tin Four Hat Comedy. Like if I did a guest spot, like I would talk about. It would have to be something with the Kennedys. Most because. comedians have without even knowing they have some conspiracy theory stuff in, in their comedy like you listen to Cat Williams there's a lot of conspiracy theory stuff in there you know what I mean but it's basically you know, a lot of comedy is making fun of the official stories like like Dave Chappelle for instance he talked about he says they said um, AIDS comes from monkeys that's what they said they want us to believe that because you know how hard it is to fuck a monkey you know what I mean? That's Dave Chappelle. That's conspiracy theory stuff. So it's like that. You know what I mean? It's not like preachy. It's just we're kind of just making fun of it. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to get killed. That's the bottom line. I'm not going to go out there and try to be fucking Che Guevara or, or fucking Alex Jones. I don't want to be that guy. I'm not trying to be that guy. If you ask me about conspiracy theories, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. You know what I mean? Um, I, I, I don't think we went to the moon. You know what I mean? I'll tell you my opinions. Uh, but I don't want to be this fucking leader of conspiracy theories. I, I like talking about them. They're fascinating, but I'm not trying to get killed. I don't need to get hung on some door with a scarf. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to do that. You're not trying to expose anything. I'm not trying to expose shit. <laughs> You're goofing on an existing yeah, situation. Yeah, and you know what? I will get serious about some conspiracy theories. I do it on podcasts all the time, but I, I don't have to. I'm not trying. I don't have a mission to put anybody in jail or to get anybody busted or anything like that. I don't want to get suicided. I'm not trying to do any of that. So you know, you can call me a shill or whatever. Who the fuck? Let cares? me ask you a question. You know what I mean? I'm I just ask you a few questions. 
I don't know if you know this. Where I come from in Jersey, it's where they see the most Martian views in the country. Where? You know that, right? Where? Northern New Jersey <laughs> is where they see the most Martian landings. I've had people on the show before, and I broke it down for them. Yeah. Where I come from, uh, Hudson County Park, YouTube, Martians, 1976. Where I come from, that park where we used to do all, we used to mug the pedophiles and shit when we were kids. <laughs> when we were kids, they closed that park off for a couple of days because there was a rocket ship that landed on that fucking thing like a, like a, like a, the same thing that landed on the moon with the little four legs. And it landed in Hudson County Park, bro, where I grew up. And the fucking, all the government agencies came, they roped it off, and they took fucking samples from the soil. And the people who live in those buildings, like six of the eight witnesses got hit by cars and died of heart attacks and shit. Which is there? Hudson, Hudson County Park Martians. Martians. And one guy, or well, two people, were talking about the lights, how they saw the lights and the thing land in Hudson County Park. And that four little things with astronaut suits came out. <laughs> and they took samples of dirt and shit. This is classic shit. In fact, in one of the Sopranos, they, they, they spoke about it. When they were having an argument one day, they said, then two months ago you were saying that you saw a rocket ship in Tenafly. All that area is hotbeds for fucking Martian landings and shit like that. Look at there the you name. go, UFOs. Look at the name of the video. Joey Diaz, UFO sightings, Hudson County Park, North Park. Hey, there it is, right there, dog. Mm -hmm. Who the fuck you think you're dealing with any problem? That's the one. Oh. Is there any clips? I think this is us talking about it on the podcast. Right there, UFOs, North Bergen, New Jersey. It's on the History Channel. Fuck that. yeah, dog. This is no joke. I ain't fucking with you, G-Money. You think I would fucking... This is also a place where there have been persistent claims of alien and UFO sightings. George Obarski owned a Manhattan liquor store and drove the same route back to his home in North Bergen, New Jersey, every night for decades. At 3 a.m. on the morning of January 12, 1975, as he was driving through the local park, his radio reception suddenly became distorted. He related subsequent events to UFO investigator Bud Hopkins, who recorded his story with a portable tape recorder. Well, I would say that that thing was 30 feet across. Mm -hmm. It was a big thing. Yeah. It's and time. It, it seemed to be, I would say, maybe six feet high. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like a pancake. Yeah. It was blown up and it was yeah. like, a, like a pancake. Right. And, and the thing landed right ahead of me. He described small figures who got out. He said they looked like kids in snowsuits. And they were each one carrying a kind of a, a squarish uh, receptacle and a long spoon-like shovel. They dug soil samples extremely quickly, spooning up the dirt, put it in the little satchels and got back in the craft. He said they moved incredibly fast, like kids coming down a fire Well, escape. what do you think? And the thing took off. Drop he was absolutely terrified. I mean, if you want, if you want to know what I, I know think. What seeing. Um, Even after Georgia. You want to hear crazy shit? Hold on. Oh. Uh, had encountered. That's the fucking, you know how many grams of coke I bought in that yeah. building? <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's circle. They call it the grinder. It's a circle building. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I used to be a big UFO guy. I was all, you know, about it. Like, you know, you, uh, you, all the reports and the sightings and then it looked like the government was trying to cover it up with project blue book you're like look it's real because look the government's trying to cover it up but when you look into it um from the dawn of time all dictators and emperors and tyrants they all they all had the same goal the same ultimate dream one world government they all wanted it and it was they all try to figure out how the fuck can they get everybody to be under one fucking emperor. And they knew way back in, uh, in Babylon times that the best way, the quickest way would be if there was some sort of invasion from the sky, 
if there was some sort of invasion, then everybody would just jump in and agree to a one world government. They wouldn't have to do all this propaganda and mind fuck, you know, uh, mind fuck routines. So, um, but they could never do it. They didn't, how are you going to get everyone to believe that there's a fake alien invasion? That was just something that they, it was, it's been written. It's like a Jesuit order plan, but there's no way you, how are you going to do that? How are you going to fake an alien invasion? So, um, uh, if you want to get crazy, it's, it, the crazy people believe that it's always been the grand plan. And that's what we've been working to step by step. They believe that, uh, like Roswell and all those Martian movies in the 50s were all designed to to convince people that the aliens could convince people that it that it's possible that we could be attacked by aliens and that would push the one world government. They know that's the ultimate goal. So, you know, uh, still the technology back in the 50s and 60s, it looks like shit. You look at those Martian movies like no one's going to believe that shit. So. The conspiracy theory is the government decided, let's pretend like we're hiding it. Let's stage some shit, like like uh, crash some shit and just tell people, like, uh, you know, spread the rumors that themselves that it was an alien uh, uh, aircraft and uh, post a bunch of shit. Like Roswell's was, was faked. It was some government psyop. That shit, they made you think. They wanted you to think that they were covering it up. So this is, the, this is the crazy conspiracy theory. So year after year, that was the plan. The plan was we we have to get everyone to believe somehow that it's possible that we can get attacked by aliens from space. So that's where all the movies came from. Star Wars, everything, the moon missions, Disneyland, all that shit to get us to believe that, that to prepare us for the fake alien invasion that will direct us right into a new world order. And they get the presidents to say that in front of the, the UN. I'm gonna play you something real quick. It's gonna take one How second. Does this, this is Ronald take? Reagan. This is Ronald Reagan. And this they all say this, Clinton, Obama, even Trump said it. They have a speech that they're supposed to say, and this is it right here. This is the speech, there's, there's gonna be 15 seconds. Look at this. This is Ronald Reagan at the UN, all right? To make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. A fake alien. See, so he, Ronald Reagan said it. All these presidents are saying Clinton said it on, on the Jimmy Kimmel show. The exact same thing. He says the same thing. So that's the conspiracy theory. It's called Project Blue Beam. Project Blue Beam is the plan. And Bill Cooper, the guy who wrote uh, Behold the Pale Horse, he's, he's a U.S. naval intelligence whistleblower. And he said, this is the plan. He's been saying this since the 90s. They're going to put holograms in the sky and make you believe that we're being attacked by aliens. Right now, you can get on YouTube and you can punch in uh, City floating in the sky in China and you could watch it and there's a city floating in the sky. No one believes it's real. They're like, this is some kind of fucking projection. What the fuck is going on? You could, there's all sorts of shit on YouTube where dudes are filming crazy shit in the sky, like weird ass fucking shit. And of course no one believes it. People are like, that's fucking, that, how can that be real? That's a hologram. So what they're doing is they're getting it into our consciousness. They're getting us, like it's been the plan for thousands of years and now we have the technology to actually do it. Fake some alien shit, scare people, just like Ronald Reagan said, you heard him say, Trump even said it. He said the exact same speech, word for word. Why the, what the fuck, why are they trying to drill this? Now we're ready. Everyone believes that, that there's gonna be a fake alien and, or that there's gonna be a, um, well, the conspiracy theorists think that this is gonna be a, a, there's a fake alien invasion coming to push us to a, a one world order. That's what Project Blue Beam. Look, look that up. No zombie apocalypse. Another. They just want to scare the shit out of us. Global warming. They're just. They're trying to scare. Uh, scare us with the environment. Scare us from space. Scare us from terrorism. Scare us with nuclear bombs. These are all just scare tactics. They scare us so that we give up more money to funds to stop this that's what global warming is about they want that carbon tax that's that fucking global carbon tax all that money all those politicians are going to be able to just steal they're going to be that's the they're like yeah we're we're, we're blowing up the world you got to turn off your car you know it's it's scare tactics the overpopulation uh apparently they've been trying to scare they they were they've been trying to scare us with overpopulation since the 70s they said by the year 2000 you know we're gonna there's there's not gonna be uh any oil and and we're gonna 
by the year 2000, people are going to be standing on top of each other's fucking heads. They were trying to, they were writing books about this, trying to scare us. Meanwhile, you could fit today's entire population with a house. They can get everyone in the in the world could have their own house in Texas. How the fuck are we overpopulated? It's bullshit. If that's true, and they say the same thing about Alaska, you could fit the entire world's population in Alaska. They could all have their own house. And how it seems unbelievable. Like, wait a minute, aren't we overpopulated? If that's true, and I talked about it on Joe Rogan's podcast, it seems like it's true because he would be all over it if it wasn't. There's overpopulation is it's just a big scare. Always a pleasure. That's just, that's just the crazy talk. Always that's a pleasure. it. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Always a pleasure having Eddie Bravo on. You let us know when you're doing your next show on the road, whatever. EBI's you know. coming up though. That's what is that? Can I plug that? Yeah. Uh EBI sixteen next Sunday in San Diego at the San Diego Performing Arts Center, EBI 16. We're gonna have a 16 woman uh, bantamweight tournament featuring Bia Basilio, Bia Mesquita, uh, Luana Alguzir. These are all IBJJF world champions. The two Bias, Mesquite and Basilio, they are probably the best girls in the world right now. What do they weigh? Oh, they're, you have to be 135 same day. And where do they, can they watch this online? You can watch it on UFC Fight Pass, or you can get tickets for the show. If you're anywhere in Southern California, go to inchbyinch.tv. And the main event is combat jiu-jitsu. It's going to be Richie Boogeyman Martinez versus Bobby Emmons for the uh, EBI CJJ welterweight belt. Uh, Richie's the belt, uh, the belt holder right now. He's the champion. Bobby's coming in there. It's, it's a rematch. Uh, Richie beat him the first time and Bobby's coming back. He's going to try to redeem himself. And also PJ Barch, he's one of the fastest rising 10th planet soldiers out there. He's going to fight combat jiu-jitsu against Mickey Rolls. So we have a 16-woman sub-only tournament plus two combat jiu-jitsu bouts, one for the welterweight belt. You ain't fucking around, are you? You know I don't play. You ain't fucking around. Like I said, July 7th, the Ice House, the 13th and 14th, South Point Casino. That's it. And that's that, you bad motherfuckers. Again, happy belated Father's Day. Thank you if you came out to the Calusa Casino. And thank you for listening to the Church of What's Happened Now with my man Eddie Bravo and the fucking Christ Killer over there. He ain't saying much tonight. The Brett Spray got him. Anyway, number one, on it, my heart. I've been with them since day one. They've been with me since day one. Why? Because their supplements work. From the Alpha Brain, which they'll give you 100% back Money back guarantee, and I don't want the product to my fucking favorite Shroom Tech. I live on that shit. I snort that shit. I love Shroom Tech Sport and the immune. I fly a lot. You don't see me with no mask with a Japanese fucking look on my face. Why? Because I do Shroom Tech immune, motherfuckers. <laughs> and I eat ass. The flu ain't going to get me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so that's the way we do it. Go to honor.com right now and press in. Church. Bam! And get 10% off. Delivered straight to your house. Number two. When it comes to geese, mats, shin guards, any of that stuff, a jump rope, a kettlebell holder, Fujisports.com. That's the way to go. My favorite gi in the world, Fuji Sports. Rash guard, Fuji. I love everything to do with Fuji. They've been around since Jesus left Chicago. Quality. <laughs> Quality. Whether it's a new Sakao point two old gi to the fucking just all purpose, to the beautiful competition gear that they have, to the Superito, which is my fucking favorite. Lightweight, durable, fucking tougher than shoe leather. You understand me? Go to Fujisports.com right now and press in. Church. Bam. C-H-U-R-C-H. And get 10% off. Delivered to your motherfucking house. I want to thank the master, Eddie Bravo. 10planetjj.com. 10 fall conspiracy, motherfucking wizard. <laughs> and I want to thank the Christ killer over there. And I want to thank you guys for listening. Stay black, and we'll see you Thursday. What's up, though? I have another show at the Sycamore Tavern on, oh, shit. on the 26th at 8.30. We have oh, Josh shit. Wolf coming. If you are in town and wanted to come, you're more than welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Um, And, yeah, that's going to be a lot of What's people. the 26th? A Wednesday? A Tuesday. A Tuesday. All right. There you have it. You have the whole fucking schedule. I love you, motherfuckers. One more time for FujiSports.com. And one more time for honor. Stay black. See you Wednesday morning.